This is the land of Havilah, Psalm 58. It's 11 verses, verse 1. For the chief musician, to the tune of Do Not Destroy, a poem by David. Do you indeed speak righteousness, silent ones? Do you judge blamelessly, you sons of men? Comment verse 1 poses two rhetorical questions. The first, do you indeed speak righteousness, silent ones? Do you indeed speak righteousness, silent ones? Well, now, let's see. If we're silent, what do we speak? A silent person speaks nothing, right? Therefore, a silent person doesn't speak righteousness. He's simply quiet. The implication here is that we should speak up. If we know the right thing, we should declare it. We shouldn't stay silent in the face of evil. We should oppose it. The question again, do you indeed speak righteousness, silent ones? It's an adjuration for us to speak up. There are many famous quotes on the subject. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany. He spoke out against Nazism and eventually died by hanging for supporting a plot to assassinate Hitler. Whether or not he should have supported the assassination, at least he was outspoken. He said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. He knew that righteous ones can't remain silent. Now, of course, righteousness and wickedness are in the eye of the beholder. What was righteous to Bonhoeffer was wicked to a Nazi. Thus, the second question in verse 1, Do you judge blamelessly, you sons of men? Do we judge blamelessly? In other words, is there something wrong with our judgment? Do we know the difference between righteousness and wickedness? Or are we sons of the devil? having righteousness and wickedness exactly backwards. So speaking now to those who establish wickedness by either not speaking out against it or by rendering faulty verdicts, David says, verse 2, No, in your heart you plot injustice. You measure out the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked go astray from the womb. They're wayward as soon as they're born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a snake, like a deaf cobra that stops its ear, which doesn't listen to the voice of the charmers, no matter how skillful the charmer may be. Comment in verse 2, You measure out the violence of your hands in the earth. It's also translated, Your hands deal out violence in the earth. In verse 4, There's a deaf cobra, also translated deaf adder. Anyhow, it's a snake. It's deaf. In verse 5, It's incapable of listening to the charmer, no matter how skillful the charmer may be. It's a metaphor that the wicked are deaf to righteousness. Preach it to them all you want. Make it as clear as you can. But they're deaf to it. The wicked are deaf to righteousness. Now for some imprecations upon the wicked. Verse 6. Break their teeth, God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, Yahweh. Let them vanish like water that flows away. When they draw the bow, let their arrows be made blunt. Let them be like a snail which melts and passes away like the stillborn child who has not seen the sun. Before your pots can feel the heat of the thorns, he'll sweep away the green and the burning alike. Comment the metaphor in verse 9 is strange, so let's break it down. Someone's gathered some vines of thorns and is using them as fuel to heat a pot. The vines are a mixture of green, which won't burn, and brown and dead, which will burn. But no matter the color, vines of thorns are representative of the wicked. Before they heat up the pot, God will sweep them away. In other words, God won't tolerate the wicked for long. He'll sweep them away. In verses 6 to 8, there are other imprecations against them. David prays God will break their teeth in their mouth, make them vanish like water that flows away, and so on. Someone might say, that's not nice. Well, what's the alternative? That God should let the wicked keep on in their wickedness? Now, fast forwarding to the time God completes his judgment against them, verse 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men shall say, Most certainly there is a reward for the righteous. Most certainly there is a God who judges the earth. Comment in verse 10. The righteous shall see God's vengeance upon the wicked. It's similar to Psalm 37, 34. Quote, when the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. End quote. Also in verse 10. The righteous will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. It sounds disgusting, but it's meant to be positive. God will destroy the wicked and will rejoice in it. We won't turn our eyes away in horror. It'll be a beautiful sight because God's judgment is true and right, Revelation 18.20.
In verse 11, when it happens, we'll say most certainly there is a reward for the righteous. Most certainly there is a God who judges the earth. Psalm 59 is next. 